The History of Ancient Greece Around the time when Greek speakers entered the Aegean, the first palaces appear on the island of Crete, signaling that the Cretans had joined the company of complex state societies. Four hundred years later, the Greeks would also reach that level of development under the general influence of the Near East, but especially through their relationship with the Cretans. That there had been advanced civilizations in the Bronze Age Aegean became demonstrated only in the late 19th century when archaeologists unearthed three cities, which up to that time were known only from the legends about the Trojan War. The central event of the Greeks' mythical Age of Heroes. First, in 1870 Heinrich Schliemann discovered the ruins of Troy in northwest Anatolia, modern Turkey. In Schliemann's day most historians regarded the Greeks' remembrance of an ancient war against Troy as just another fable. Four years later, Schliemann turned to the site of Mycenae in southern Greece, which tradition held to be the city of King Agamemnon, the leader of the Greek invasion of Troy. To everyone's surprise, Schliemann's excavations of the Bronze Age level uncovered a large fortified palace complex worthy of a mighty warrior king. Although Schliemann's discoveries are not conclusive evidence of a large-scale war between Trojans and Greeks, the impressive ruins unearthed at both sites, with their immense quantities of gold and other costly things, do confirm the Greeks' remembrance of their heroic age, I. E. The Late Bronze Age, as a time of fabulous wealth and splendor. Because of the importance of Mycenae in fact and myth, the Late Bronze Age in Greece is commonly referred to as the Mycenaean period. Equally spectacular was Sir Arthur Evans' discovery in 1899 of the palace complex of Knossos on Crete, whose magnificence gave credence to the legends that in ancient times Knossos had been the center of a powerful naval state. Evans named this first Aegean civilization Minoan. After the mythical king Minos of Knossos, who lived, according to Homer, three generations before the Trojan War. The Minoans first settled around 700 BC by Neolithic farmers and stock raisers of unknown origin and language. Crete followed the regional path of slow growth, helped along by technological innovation. During the fourth millennium, some of the small farming villages had grown into large towns. Eventually, the chiefs of these early centers emerged as monarchs over other chiefs and people in their districts. The earliest large multi-room complex, which Evans named the Palace of Minas, was built about 2000 BC at Knossos. By then a town with several thousand inhabitants. Other major palaces, not as grand as Knossos, followed at Phaistos, Malia, Zacro, and elsewhere, each center controlling an area of a few hundred square miles. The political and cultural flowering in Crete, and on other Aegean islands as well, probably can be attributed to their inclusion in the international trade. The island's location and natural harbors made it an important crossroad in the trade routes across the Mediterranean Sea. The palace-centered economies that emerged in Crete were replicas, on a much smaller scale, of the economies of the Near Eastern states. It has not been established. However, whether Knossos ever became the center of a unified island-wide kingdom or was the largest and most powerful among a number of self-ruling states. The Knossos we see today was begun around 1700 BC, after the first palace was destroyed by an earthquake. Knossos and the other smaller Cretan palaces consisted of a maze of rooms, residential quarters, workshops, and storerooms clustered around a large central courtyard. This impressive residence of the ruler and a few high-ranking subordinates was the political, economic,
and administrative center and indeed the focal point of state ceremony and religious ritual for the entire kingdom. The palace economies were based on storage and redistribution. Food and other products from the palace's lands and from private farms and herds, paid as taxes, were collected and stored in the palace. The income both sustained the palace and its crafts workers and was redistributed back to the villagers as rations and wages. The palace's reserves of grain and olive oil could also be distributed to the population during famines. The main use of the royal surplus, however, was for trade. Produce and goods manufactured in the palace went out on ships along the wide Mediterranean trade network in exchange for goods from foreign lands, especially metal and luxury items. To administer their complicated economies, the Cretans developed a writing system in a script Evans named Linear A, comprised of specific signs that stood for the sounds of spoken syllables. Linear A writing preserved on small clay tablets found not only on Crete but in other Aegean islands, remains largely untranslated. It is clear, however, that its main purpose was for keeping economic and administrative records. As in the Near East, there was an enormous gulf between the ruling class and the people. The multitude of ordinary Cretan farmers and crafts workers paid for the opulent lifestyles of the few with their labor and taxes, while they themselves lived very modestly in small mud brick houses clustered together in the towns and villages. To be sure, the people received benefits in the form of protection from famine and from outside aggressors. But their compliance with the rigid hierarchy suggests something more, a positive identification with the center. That is, the king. In Crete, as in all ancient kingdoms, the king was a symbol as well as the actual ruler. He was the embodiment of the state. Supreme war leader, lawgiver and judge, and, most important, the intermediary between gods and the land and people. Indeed, some Mediterranean scholars describe the Minoan kings as priest kings like their counterparts in Egypt and Mesopotamia, whose legitimacy derived from the official equation of royal power with the will of the gods. A ruler with such coercive powers as the Wanax could claim that his sovereignty was divinely sanctioned and that he was the special representative of the community to the gods. There is no evidence, however, to suggest that a Wanax was considered divine either in his lifetime or after death, or that he functioned as a priest king over a theocratic state. As in Egypt and Mesopotamia, the Wanax was Above all, a warrior king who took part in the fighting along with his military commander and subordinate commanders. In fact, throughout ancient Greek history, most political leaders would also be the commanders in chief, and many would meet death on the battlefield or on the sea. Mycenaean warriors were heavily armored. Officers wore helmets of bronze or of boar's tusks. Corslets of bronze plates and bronze greaves, knee and shin protectors. The soldiers were equipped with leather and padded linen versions of these. All combatants carried large shields made of ox hide stretched over a wooden frame. Their weapons were bronze swords and daggers, heavy thrusting spears and light throwing spears, and bows and arrows. The Mycenaeans most impressive weapon was the chariot. Adopted from the Near East around 1600 BC. A lightweight platform set atop two high spoked wheels and pulled by two horses. The chariot could carry two men at a pace previously unknown in land travel. Throughout the Near East, the chariot corps was the primary military arm used for massed chariot charges against an enemy's chariots and infantry.
one man driving and the other shooting arrows. But because the rough terrain of Greece is unsuited for such tactics, many believe that the Mycenaeans employed chariots only to convey heavily armored elite warriors to and from the fighting. On the other hand, it is conceivable that many versions of Eastern chariot warfare took place on the plains that lay below the Mycenaean fortresses. In any case, the significance of the chariot was probably not so much its use in battle, but rather its prestige value. Like other material borrowings, such as the grand palaces and the tholos, tombs, Chariotry proclaimed the Mycenaean rulers to be the equals of the great kings of Asia and Egypt. Mycenaean art depicts the elite employing chariots also for hunting, racing, and ceremonial processions, as upper-class Greeks would for many centuries after the chariot had ceased to have any military function. The Fall of the Mycenaean Civilization At the apparent height of its prosperity, Mycenaean civilization suffered a fatal blow. Beginning around 1200 BC, almost all the palace centers and many of their outlying towns and villages were attacked and destroyed or else abandoned. Order gave way to turbulence and restless wanderings. Many centers, Pylos among them, were never reoccupied after the initial devastation, while others recovered and even enjoyed a brief resurgence but soon succumbed to further attacks. A few, like Mycenaean Tyrans, lived on as small villages huddled below the ruined fortifications of their once mighty palaces. By 1100, the Mycenaean kingdoms and the complex systems that had supported them no longer existed. It was not just Mycenaean civilization that suffered. The entire eastern Mediterranean region was overwhelmed by catastrophe at this time. The mighty Hittite Empire, which encompassed Anatolia and Syria, fell apart around 1200 BC, crushed by invaders from the north. Egypt was attacked several times by an assortment of warrior bands from all around the Mediterranean. Quite possibly Mycenaeans were among these marauders who are referred to as the Sea Peoples in Egyptian records. It was also during this period that the fall of Troy occurred. There is no way of knowing whether those who besieged and burned the city were really the Mycenaean Greeks. As the legend of the Trojan War tells, until fairly recently it was thought that the Dorians were responsible for destroying and looting the Mycenaean palaces. The modern Dorian invasion hypothesis is largely based on the legends of later Doric speakers. Doric was one of the three main dialects of ancient Greek, spoken in the Peloponnesus, Crete and other Aegean islands, and parts of the Anatolian coast. Dorians claimed ancestry from the mythical hero Heracles, Hercules, whose sons. So the story went were expelled from the Peloponnesus after his death. Several generations after the Trojan War, Heracles' descendants returned south to reclaim by force their rightful ownership of their ancient homeland. The invasion hypothesis was popular because it accounted well for both the initial destructions and the dominant presence of Doric speakers in the Peloponnesus during historical times. Moreover, it was corroborated by the words of the ancient Greeks themselves. Against the theory, however, certain practices, such as cremation of the dead, and objects like the handmade pottery called barbarian ware, supposedly introduced by the invaders, were already present in Mycenaean Greece well before 1200 BC because no single cause could have had such widespread and profound effects. A more plausible explanation for the breakdown of the old order is that the Mycenaeans experienced a massive systems collapse, that is to say. The entire system, the Mycenaean civilization, suffered a cascading series of negative consequences brought on by disequilibrium between its subsystems, its various spheres of activity.
such as trade, agricultural production, metallurgy, and the crafting of artifacts. Marauding bands of sea peoples could have provided one catalyst. By obstructing sea trade in the Aegean, which in turn would have cut off the supply of tin and copper for bronze production. If external trade ceased, not only goods but social contacts too would be lost, ideas as well as objects could not be exchanged. At the same time, natural disasters, like prolonged drought, soil exhaustion, and earthquakes, could have put pressure on the food distribution subsystem which may have already been undermined by the inefficiency of the top-heavy palace bureaucracies. As food and other crucial resources became scarce, the people might have turned against one another. At this point, when the system had already become weak and vulnerable, internecine warfare, uprisings of the people, or slave revolts might have precipitated the final collapse. Early Greece and the Bronze Age. Along with the destruction of the palaces, the centralized, rigidly hierarchical states disappeared forever from Greece. Underneath the veneer of great wealth and stability, the Mycenaean economy and government were shallowly rooted. Essentially fragile systems. With the end of this stage of Greek history would come the beginning of a new era. So different that when the Greeks looked back upon their own Bronze Age past, they could only imagine it as a kind of mythical dream world. A time when gods and humans mingled together. In the middle of the 12th century BC, there were still a few places in Greece where the palaces survived. But these signs of economic and cultural vitality soon fade from the archaeological record. By the early 11th century, the Greek world had settled into its dark age. A period of steep decline and slow recovery that lasted until the 8th century. During those obscure centuries, new social and political patterns were formed, out of which would emerge, in the 8th century, a new type of political organization. The city-state, polis. There were no more kings, officials, scribes, palace staffs, or state armies, gone was the elaborate redistributive system. Monumental stone buildings were no longer erected. Elaborate frescoes and fine furniture were no longer commissioned. And even the art of writing was lost. Bronze, gold, and other luxury imports dwindled to a trickle as vital trade links were broken. All across the Greek world, towns and village were left abandoned. Their inhabitants either dead or gone to other places. Some as close as Achaea and Arcadia. Some as far away as Palestine and Cyprus. It is true that movements and dislocations of people can exaggerate an impression of overall depopulation, yet it is safe to say that in the Two centuries following 1200 Greece emptied out far more than it filled up. By 1000 BC its population was probably the lowest in a thousand years. For the early 20th century historians who coined the phrase Greek Dark Age, the four centuries that lay hidden between the fall of Mycenae and the the Dark Age of Greece and the 8th century Renaissance birth of the city-state were a period of total obscurity coupled with utter poverty and stagnation. Recent archaeological findings, however, indicate that some regions within Greece recovered much sooner than others and that recovery took different forms. Areas bordering on the Aegean Sea appear to have suffered a briefer period of decline and to have bounced back sooner than regions in western Greece. In fact, at several major centers, including Athens, Occupation continued without interruption, many were reoccupied within a generation or two. After their destruction, farmers continued to farm, growing the same crops they had always grown, herders tended their flocks as before, 
women spun and wove their wool and flax. Potters, metalworkers, and carpenters still practiced their crafts. And the people kept worshipping their gods and performing religious rituals. In short, the timeless rhythm and activities of the agricultural year and the farming village remained unchanged and would remain constant over the following centuries. Even when the material culture appears to have been at its nadir, important technological innovations appeared. Around 1050 the combination of several new techniques and small inventions produced a superior pottery that was well proportioned and finely decorated. A faster potter's will improved the shape of the vases. For the first time, potters were using a compass, to which several brushes were attached, to draw perfect arcs, half circles, and concentric circles. Lines were drawn with a ruler instead of freehand. New shapes and designs emerged, enhanced by more lustrous glaze achieved by firing at a higher temperature. This new style, called protogeometric, seems to have originated in Attica and spread to other regions. It was also about this time that Greek metalworkers mastered the difficult process of smelting and working iron. Iron weapons and tools were harder than bronze and kept their edge better. Iron technology was long known in the East. But the Mycenaeans had not exploited the sources of iron or available in Greece. But when the disruption of trade largely cut off access to copper and tin, necessity proved the mother of invention. From 1050 on, Small local iron industries sprang up all across the mainland and the islands. By 950, almost every weapon and tool found in graves is made of iron, not bronze. Beginning around 1050 there was an accelerated movement from the Greek mainland across the Aegean Sea to the Anatolian coast. During this time a number of settlements were established. Among them Miletus, the earliest. Ephesus, and Colophon, that would become thriving cities. These population shifts created what the Mycenaeans had not, a large permanent presence in the east, and ensured that the Aegean Sea would one day be known as the Greek Sea. On the mainland during this time, some major settlements, like Athens and Corinth, might have had populations in the low thousands, however, most sites held no more than a few dozen to a few hundred people. Homer and Oral Poetry An oral poet was a skilled storyteller who sang or chanted in verse before an audience to the accompaniment of a stringed instrument called the kitharis. Later Greeks revered Homer, the composer of the Iliad and the Odyssey, as their greatest poet. Although they knew nothing about his life aside from the tradition that he was blind and from Ionia. The two poems are generally dated to between the later 8th and early 7th century BC, about the time when writing reappeared in Greece. It is possible that Homer, an illiterate bard, dictated his long epics to persons who could write. Homer and other Greek oral poets would have had at their disposal a store of traditional plots characters, and themes that they had learned from previous generations of singers, who in turn had learned them from their elders, and so on back in time. In retelling the ancient stories that were familiar to their audiences, poets could also draw on an inherited stock of formulas, fixed phrases, lines, and blocks of text which they had memorized and could vary as the occasion demanded. Over a lifetime of private rehearsals, writing and rewriting the poetry in his mind, a skilled poet like Homer would have crafted and perfected the poems that bore his personal signature. At the same time, 
the traditional narrative framework was flexible enough to permit the changing and varied concerns of his audiences to be incorporated into the bard's performances, each performance would be fresh and updated. When the epics were finally committed to writing, probably within the poet's lifetime, they were fossilized. So to speak. And thus lost this ability to be continuously recreated. Yet they gained the advantage of some degree of protection from further modification. The epics are set in the Age of Heroes, which encompass a generation or two before, and one generation after. The Legendary Trojan War The tale of the Trojan War is a classically simple folk saga. Paris The son of King Priam of Troy Seduced and brought back to Troy the beautiful Helen the wife of Menelaus, ruler of the Spartans. To avenge the insult, Menelaus and his brother, Agamemnon, Wanax of Mycenae, gathered a huge army of Achaean warriors. The Achaeans sailed to Troy, destroyed the city after a ten-year siege, and then dispersed, each contingent to its own homeland. Whether or not a Trojan War actually occurred will probably never be known. For the Greeks, however, it was the pivotal event of their early history. Yet the epics, though set in this distant past, are not really about history nor are they about the Trojan War. History and war are the background for the enactment of social dramas whose protagonists are caught up in the kinds of dilemmas that every generation experiences and must deal with. The nagging question for historians is this. Do the epics tell us anything about actual Greek society? Whether of Homer's own day, late 8th or perhaps early 7th century, or of some earlier date? Or are they pure fictions? Which have only symbolic meaning? The answer of course, is somewhere in the middle? The Homeric world was a past world that was in every way bigger, better, and more fantastic than the environment of the contemporary audiences. Nevertheless, aspects of that imaginary world, its interests, passions, ideologies, and to some degree its social institutions, must have conformed to audiences' real-life experiences. The norms and values of Homeric society are internally consistent and coherent enough to be given a place in the not-so-long-ago past, which we may assign roughly to the end of the Greek Dark Age. Community and Household Social and economic life at the end of the 9th century was centered in the local communities, most of which were still quite small. The Greeks did not live in isolated farmsteads, but clustered together in small settlements. Farmers would walk out each morning to their plots and return to the village at dusk. Communities were closely knit through generations of intermarrying with other families within the village and in other villages of the same demos. From Homer we may infer that the smallest unit of Dark Age society was the household. The oikos was the center of a person's existence, and every member was preoccupied with its preservation, its economic well-being, and social standing. The word oikos signified not only the house itself but also the family, the land, livestock, and all other property and goods, including slaves. Greek society was patrilineal and patriarchal. The father was supreme in the household by custom and later by law. Descent was through the father. And on his death the property was divided equally among his sons. Although daughters did not inherit directly they received a share of their parents' wealth as a dowry. Because daughters in Homer are prized. Suitors customarily give Hedna, wooing gifts, to the bride's father as part of the marriage contract. The new bride took up residence in the house of her husband, thus their children belonged to the husband's oikos, not to hers. 
among chieftain families, which are the only ones described in Homer, married sons continue to reside in the paternal oikos with their wives and children. Not infrequently. Though, the custom is reversed. A powerful chief brings his daughter's new husband into his own household instead. In this way, he gets to keep his daughter and acquires a new man to fight and work for the oikos. Another means of increasing the oikos is for the father to beget additional children by slave women. But that could cause friction in the family. Odysseus' father did not sleep with a newly bought slave woman and so avoided his wife's anger. Although the male children of slaves are inferior to the legitimate sons in respect to inheritance rights, they are otherwise full members of the family and part of its fighting force and workforce. Illegitimate daughters seem to have the same status as their legitimate half-sisters. For many parts of Greece, the 8th century was a period of population growth, technological innovations, and increasing political centralization. The 8th century was dubbed by modern historians the Greek Renaissance because it appeared to be a revival of the glories of the Mycenaean age. During this period trade links multiplied. Communication with the East intensified. Writing was reintroduced into Greece and prosperous new communities were established in the West. As the Mediterranean world became increasingly more interlinked, even the more isolated areas of Greece were drawn into networks of cultural exchange. People of neighboring areas were meeting together more regularly to celebrate religious rituals, which included competitions among athletes and bards. Communities also vied with one another in the production of luxury items, such as finely decorated pottery and bronze tripods, and in building monumental temples. Still, we should not view the 8th century as a radical break from the past, but rather as an acceleration of trends visible already in the 10th century. The rise of a landowning aristocracy. Population growth put pressure on the land. Although pasture land was nominally open to all, in reality the elite families had long before appropriated the best for themselves. In particular the lush grassy meadows where they grazed their large herds of cattle and horses. They converted more and more of this fertile soil to growing grain and other crops. A much more productive use of land. In this way, the already land-rich oikoi households were able to acquire more arable land until, in the course of a few generations, they came to own a disproportionate amount of the total land. No doubt prior occupancy enabled some oikoi to claim some legal right to plow and plant the traditional pasturelands. But quite possibly chicanery and even use of force were involved in this land grab. In any case, by the early 7th century the elite minority had transformed themselves into an aristocracy of large landowners. While the majority continued to live off small to medium farm plots and a few animals. We should, however, be careful to put scarcity of land into perspective. Nowhere in 8th century Greece did the population approach the carrying capacity of the land. In fact, the countryside continued to be filled in throughout the 7th and into the 6th century. The problem was not that there was no land, but rather that the most productive land was concentrated in the hands of a minority of the families. Sons whose inherited share of their paternal claros was insufficient for their growing families would be compelled to seek marginal land in the outskirts of the demos, where they had to work harder for less return. For the ambitious, there was another solution to the problem of land hunger. Relocation abroad. Colonization and the growth of trade. In the second half of the 8th century substantial numbers of people left Greece to establish new farming communities in southern Italy and Sicily. These colonizers followed the trail blazed by earlier adventurers. Who sailed west? <laughs>
not to farm but to trade. Overseas trade with foreigners, which had been increasing gradually since the 10th century, expanded considerably in the 8th. Shortly before 800, Greeks from Euboea joined the international trading post of Almina in northern Syria. And not long after that other Eubeans founded a trading colony at Pithecusi in southern Italy. Once again, Greek ships in significant numbers were plying the trade routes across the Mediterranean and were even competing with the Phoenicians, who had long been the leading sea merchants in the Mediterranean. The new Greek colonies that sprang up in the West offered the settlers not only a good-sized claros on good soil but also opportunities to trade their own products and those of old Greece for raw materials, especially metal. With the inhabitants of southern Europe, colonization and the expansion of trade and commerce had broad economic effects throughout the towns and villages of the Greek world. There was more work for craftsmen, sailors, shipbuilders and outfitters, and haulers. Even small farmers took advantage of the economic opportunities offered by this expanded world. Hesiod takes it for granted that a farmer will put part of his surplus production in a boat and sail a fair distance for profit. The big landholders benefited most. However, because they could produce large surpluses for the market and could subsidize the costs and bear the losses of long sea voyages. The alphabet and writing. The increased contacts with the East led to the most significant cultural achievement of the late Dark Age. The Greek alphabet. Somewhere, most likely in the Eastern Mediterranean, Greeks borrowed letters from the Phoenician alphabet, which consisted primarily of signs for consonants. They adapted certain of the Phoenician characters to represent the sounds of the Greek consonants and changed the value of other consonant signs, making them into vowels. Thus was born an alphabet that was largely phonetic. It is generally believed that this occurred around 800 BC. To judge from the evidence, which is very meager, it appears that one of the earliest uses for the alphabet was to write down verses of poetry. Two of the earliest examples of connected Greek words are, in fact, bits of epic-like verse scratched on vases dated to the second half of the 8th century. While these graffiti do show that the Homeric epics could have been written down at least by the later 8th century, they do not prove, as some propose, that the alphabet was devised in order to preserve orally composed poems in written form. On the other hand, supporters of this theory point out that the invention of signs for vowels was essential to reproduce in writing the metrical rhythms of Greek poetry. Another early function of writing was to record ownership of personal property and, probably not much later, to keep commercial accounts. Whatever the initial motive, once writing was established it was put to many different uses. The earliest specimen of a civic use of writing is a stone inscription of laws from Dreros in Crete. Carved around 650. Writing spread quickly throughout the Greek-speaking world, though not as one standard alphabet, but rather as numerous local scripts, with variations in the forms and numbers of characters and in the sounds they represented. The alphabetical script of about 25 letters was a huge advance over the cumbersome linear B syllabic system of 87 signs because most of the alphabetical characters stood for a single spoken sound. It was fairly easy to learn to read and even to write Greek. And yet, although the numbers of people who could read and write increased over time, mass literacy was never achieved in ancient Greece. Indeed, through the 8th and most of the 7th century, Greece was almost as completely oral-oral as it had been in the Dark Age. Even in the Classical and Hellenistic periods, when literacy was most widespread, 
Most information passed from mouth to ear. Political union could not have occurred unless the local basilize. The leaders of the districts, towns, and villages of the demos wished it. These men, the new landowning aristocracy, were the planners and architects of the new centralized government of the emerging city states. The new, more complex systems of organization and social control that arose in the city states were a necessary response to changing conditions. Sustained population growth, increasing productivity and trade, and more complicated relationships with neighboring states. Especially pressing was the need for ways to mobilize manpower and resources efficiently for warfare. For as population increased and land became scarcer, Polis fought each other over territory. A more serious business than the raids and counter-raids for animals and booty that characterized war in the Dark Age. The new system of governance was thus good for the polis as a whole. But it was especially good for the large landowners who made up the government and, like all dominant groups in human history, were highly motivated to preserve their economic and political power. The Basilius did not disappear completely. In a few polis, a type of the traditional hereditary chiefdom, with severe limits on the paramount leader's power, appears to have continued on through the Archaic period. The Spartans retained the chieftain system the longest, though in a unique form, with two hereditary, lifelong basilis ruling as equals. In this dual kingship the Spartan basilis exercised considerable authority, especially in the military sphere. But their powers were curbed by five annually elected magistrates, called ephoroi, overseers. Their job was to make sure that the basilis ruled lawfully and to prosecute them if they did not. In most polis, however, the title Basilius became just the name for one of a number of officials who made up the collective leadership of a city-state. The powerful families divided up the spheres of authority, administrative, military, religious, and judicial, among themselves, creating magistracies and boards. Later Greeks called this form of government oligarchy or rule by the few. Unlike in the previous system, positions of authority could not be inherited, and their tenure was brief. In most states, by the middle of the 7th century, term of office was limited to a single year and could not be held again until a stipulated number of years had passed. In this way, the power of any single magistrate was checked and honors were shared among the whole of the aristocratic community. Each city-state developed its own system of magistracies according to its own needs and circumstances. Obviously, small polis needed fewer officials than the large ones. In general there was no hierarchy among the major offices. Although many, States did have a principal official who was regarded as the chief administrator. The chief magistrate sometimes retained the old title of Basilius. In some polis, e. g. at Athens and Megara, an officer called the Polomarchos, war leader, was in charge of military operations. Supervision of religious activities fell to another magistrate, or, more often, a board of magistrates, which also judged crimes having to do with religion, such as homicides, which polluted the community. The common use of the title basilis to designate these officials speaks to the reverence that is still attached to the name. The real center of power in the early city-states, however, resided not in the officials and boards but in the council of elders. The bull in the archaic polis had even more power than the bull in Homeric society.
It met more frequently than in the pre-state period and assumed for itself the task of making policies and drafting laws for the polis. The members were normally recruited from the highest magistrates who entered the council after their terms of office. Membership in the council was usually for a long term or even for life. The archons and other magistrates, by contrast, had limited terms and would hesitate to oppose the august body of prominent men whose ranks they wished someday to join. As the authority of the council increased, the limited power of the old assembly of adult male citizens to influence policy was further reduced in the oligarchic city-state. Some states excluded the poorest citizens from membership in the assembly by imposing a property qualification. Some restricted the number of assembly meetings and the business to be brought before it. Or they curtailed free discussion of the issues. The sovereignty of the aristocratic council, however, would be relatively short-lived, as time passed. The authority of the assembly to decide policy would increase. The Colonizing Movement The widespread emigration of Greeks from their Aegean homelands that had begun in the mid-8th century continued for more than two centuries. When it ended around 500 BC the Greek world extended from Spain in the west to Colchis in the east. As we saw in Chapter 2, this remarkable expansion was driven by two needs. To satisfy the Greeks' growing appetite for imported goods especially scarce metals, and to provide citizens of the motherland enough fertile land to live a good life in their new polis. Founding a colony required careful preparation. With the emergence of the city-states, the external problem of coexistence became much more complicated. What had been raids among neighboring communities turned into serious warfare. There were several reasons for the heightened tensions. As states began to run out of land, they attempted to extend their boundaries. And disputes often erupted over borderlands that had not required strict definition when populations were still small. Moreover, quarrels of mother polis were often taken up by their colonies, with new enmities arising among polis hundreds of miles away. On the mainland territorial wars between polis began as early as the late 8th century, when Chalcis and Eritrea in Euboea fought over possession of the rich Lelantos river plain that lay between them. In this conflict, known as the Lelantine War, both sides were said to have had distant allies from much farther away, possibly indicating the involvement of rival colonial networks. Interstate tensions were especially high in the Peloponnesus, which contained three of the major Greek city-states, Sparta, Argos, and Corinth. After their conquest of Messenia in the late 8th century, the Spartans warred against their rivals, the Argives, with some success, though they were badly beaten by them in. 669 BC in a battle at Hizi in Argolis. The Argives in the meantime were trying to expand their own land holdings and influence within the Peloponnesus. Particularly around Corinth, the Corinthians themselves were fighting over territory with their smaller neighbors, Megara and Sicyon. Such costly and deadly squabbles over land continued in the Peloponnesus until the middle of the 6th century when the Spartans began using diplomacy and forming alliances to maintain their supremacy in southern Greece. In the 6th century the Greek states began in earnest to establish formal mechanisms for avoiding war. Most of these cooperative institutions had their genesis in the pre-state period. But it was not until the later Archaic Age that they were refined and regularized. At the same time that formal means were being instituted, Diplomatic relations were still being conducted much as they had been in the Dark Age. The tyrants especially conducted foreign policy this way. Making pacts of friendship or marriage alliances with other tyrants or with the top aristocrats. Rise of Athens-Persian War.
During the Archaic period, numerous Greek city-states struggled with a variety of problems, factional quarrels between aristocratic families, tension between aristocrats and the people, and tyranny. Sparta found a unique solution to the Archaic crisis and so did Athens. By 500 BC Athens' problems had been largely resolved. The last tyrant had been expelled. Athens had a democratic government. And aristocratic stasis was largely confined to competing for office and persuading the assembly. Because of their relative harmony, wealth, and great numbers, the Athenians had become the second most powerful Greek polis. They were poised to play a major role in the great war that was about to begin. For while the Greek city-states were evolving, the Persian Empire was growing into an ambitious power that would threaten to engulf the Hellenic world. A strong Athens would be vital to the defense of Greece against invasions by the Persian kings Darius I and Xerxes. Athens from the Bronze Age to the Early Archaic Age Literary very evidence in physical remains show that during the late Bronze Age Athens was the largest and most important settlement on the Attic Peninsula and a major Mycenaean palace center that exercised a loose control over the other fortified palace centers in the region. These remained, however, independent of the Athenian Wanax. Archaeology also confirms the tradition that the invasions of the late 13th century BC bypassed Athens. Still, if the story about the Achaeans taking refuge at Athens is true, they would have found in Attica the same collapse of the centralized ruling structure, drastic depopulation, and dispersal into small village communities as in the regions from which they had fled. The first sign of Athenian recovery from the post-invasion slump is the appearance of proto-geometric pottery around 1050 BC. Although reduced to a cluster of villages around the Acropolis, Athens continued without interruption as the central place of Attica. It is likely that by 900 BC, if not earlier, the Basileus of Athens was preeminent within Attica. A series of rich 9th century graves reveals significant growth in wealth and overseas trade during the later Dark Age. The population around Athens rose sharply during the 8th century, and new settlements appeared throughout Attica, perhaps through internal colonization from the plain of Athens. Significantly, Athens did not colonize overseas during the late 8th century. The Sinoicism or joining together of the towns and villages of Attica into a political unity under the leadership of Athens was probably gradual only being completed around the middle of the 8th century. The Athenians ascribed the unification to Theseus, whom myth linked with his companion, the Dorian hero Heracles. Theseus exploits, such as defeating the Minotaur in Crete and the Amazons in Athens, were enshrined in Athenian art and literature. In making Theseus the founder of Athens and its democracy, the Athenians followed the common Greek practice of attributing important events of the proliterate period to some great figure from the legendary past. More important than the details of the process of unification is the fact that after the Dark Ages every settlement in Attica considered itself Athenian. And none attempted to declare its independence as happened elsewhere. Nor were there subordinate populations such as the Spartan Helots or Perioikoi. The unification of Attica, however, created unique problems. Although all Athenian citizens could participate in the government of Athens, in reality people who lived in or near Athens would find it easier to vote than those who lived farther away. Thus, for example, a visit to Athens by a farmer who lived 15 or 20 miles away would probably require three days. The importance of this fact for understanding Athenian history cannot be underestimated since until the outbreak of the Peloponnesian War in 431 BC most people still lived in the countryside.
The early government of Athens was aristocratic. Probably during the later 8th century the chiefs of Attica replaced the paramount Basilius with three civic officials called collectively archons, that is, the leaders who divided the leadership roles among themselves. One of the archons, called the Basilius, administered the city's cults of the polis and judged lawsuits pertaining to cult property and other religious matters. The polemarch, war archon, commanded the army and judged disputes involving non-citizens. The Conspiracy of Silon Only two events of Athenian history are known from the 7th century. Both plainly connected with unrest of some kind. About 632 BC, an Olympic victor named Silon took advantage of his marriage connection with Theogenes, the tyrant of nearby Megara, to seize the Acropolis and attempt to become tyrant of Athens, only to find himself and his supporters besieged by the Athenians. Silon and his brother escaped. But his supporters, who had taken refuge at the altar of Athena, surrendered to the nine archons on condition that their lives would be spared. The conspirators even tied a thread to the statue of Athena and descended while holding on to it, hoping the goddess would protect them. When the thread snapped, however, the archon Megacles and his supporters killed them. People believed that Megacles had committed sacrilege and soon his family was exiled, including dead relatives whose bodies were exhumed and cast beyond the Attic frontier. Although Silon's coup failed, it played an interesting role in future Athenian history because of the prominent family to which Megacles belonged. The Alcmean Aegeinos would contribute important politicians to Athens, including Cleisthenes and Pericles, two of the most prominent Athenian statesmen of the 6th and 5th centuries. Politically motivated demands for the expulsion of the accursed repeatedly sent shock waves through the body politic because people believed that the family's shared responsibility for its members' impious actions might call the wrath of the gods down on the state. Pisistratus and his sons Solon's reforms eased social tensions in Attica by intensifying the competition for political office. However, they probably indirectly fostered the civil strife that led to the tyranny of Pisistratus. The inhabitants of 6th century Attica were loosely divided into three factions known as the Men of the Plain, the Men of the Coast, and the Men of the Hill. Historians still debate the composition of each group. The men of the plain were probably large landowners while the men of the coast were fishermen and craftsmen and the poorer inhabitants of the Attic highlands made up the men of the hill, perhaps the city dwellers were in this last group as well. Pisistratus' seizure of power Around 560, a distant relative of Solon from northern Attica named Pisistratus successfully carried out a coup. Pisistratus backers included not only the men of the hill but also some of the city dwellers. According to Herodotus, Pisistratus wounded himself and his mules and then appeared in the agora demanding a bodyguard to protect himself from his alleged enemies. Although Solon supposedly warned the Athenians against his kinsmen's duplicity, the assembly voted Pisistratus a bodyguard. Whereupon Pisistratus seized the Acropolis and with it the reins of government. After about five years, the parties of the plain and the coast united against Pisistratus and drove him out. But when Megacles, the leader of the coastal party, quarreled not only with the party of the plain but also with his own faction, he decided to ally with Pisistratus and agreed to re establish him in Athens provided he married his daughter. A century later Herodotus marveled at the story that Pisistratus effected his return to Athens by dressing a beautiful tall woman in armor and putting out the rumor that Athena was escorting him to Athens. Although from the very earliest times the Greeks have been distinguished from the barbarians by their intelligence and freedom from simple-minded foolishness.
Solon's system in force but manipulating the laws so that his friends and relatives were elected archons, while mercenaries held in check potential opponents, whose children he used as hostages. When the last of Pisistratus' sons was expelled in 510, the way lay open for the development of the democratic institutions that are still associated with the city of Athens. Although it might seem that a tyranny would roll back. Draco's and Solon's efforts to undermine the influence of powerful families. The reality was that after the fall of the Pisistratids, the development of democracy profited from the tyranny's equalizing effect. Under the rule of the tyrants, all Athenians, rich and poor, found themselves surprisingly in similar circumstances. Pisistratus Policies Strengthening the economy was a major focus of Pisistratus' program. Like Solon, he was concerned about both agriculture and commerce. He offered land and loans to the needy. He encouraged the cultivation of the olive. And Athenian trade expanded greatly under his regime. During the first half of the 6th century, Athenian exports had begun appearing throughout the Mediterranean and Aegean. And it is difficult to believe that this explosion was not due at least in part to Solon. Under Pisistratus fine Attic pottery traveled still farther, to Ionia, Cyprus, and Syria in the east and as far west as Spain. Black figure painting reached its apogee shortly after the middle of the century. And around 530 potters began to experiment with the more versatile red figure style. Pisistratus or his sons also issued the first owls silver coins stamped with the image of Athena's sacred god, that quickly became the soundest currency in the Aegean. The growth of commerce was accompanied by an ambitious foreign policy. Naxus available as a residence for Pisistratus hostages. Pisistratus also placed Sygeum under the control of one of his sons and established a foothold across the Hellespont in the Thracian Chersonese, the Gallipoli Peninsula. By sending Miltiades, a member of the Philaid clan and a potential rival, to rule the Delonci, a Thracian tribe that lived there. In Athens, Pisistratus' building projects provided jobs to the poor while focusing attention on Athens as the cultural center of Attica. Replacing the private wells guarded by aristocrats with public fountain houses not only meant construction jobs, but also a shift from private to public patronage. With expanded opportunities for jobs and housing in the city, Athens' population grew, and the people who lived in the urban area found it easier to vote. Pisistratus also rebuilt the Temple of Athena on the Acropolis and began a temple to Olympian Zeus so large that it was completed only seven centuries later by the Roman Emperor Hadrian. Pisistratus' support of the gods and the arts enhanced both his own reputation and that of the city of Athens. He established two new festivals, the Greater and Lesser Dionysia, and instituted around 534 BC competition in tragic drama as part of the Dionysia. The worship of Dionysus flourished in Pisistratid Athens, and Dionysiac scenes of drinking and unrestrained merrymaking were popular subjects of vase painting. Sparta Admired in peace and dreaded in war For much of the archaic and classical period Sparta was the most powerful city in the Greek world. It was also different from other polis. To be sure, the Spartans shared many basic institutions with other Greeks. Their society was patriarchal and polytheistic. Servile labor played a key role. Agriculture formed the basis of the economy. Law was revered and martial valor prized. Nonetheless, Sparta was unique in many important ways. No other Greek state ever defined its goals as clearly as Sparta or expended so much effort in trying to attain them. While the intrusion of the state into the lives of individuals was substantial in all Greek states, no state surpassed Sparta in the invasive role it played in daily life. Spartans took enormous pride in their polis.
and other Greeks were impressed by the patriotism and selflessness the Spartan system entailed. The Spartans' denial of individuality fostered a powerful sense of belonging that other Greeks envy. And Sparta continues to cast a spell over historians, philosophers, feminists, and political scientists. Despite the interest the Spartans sparked in Greek intellectuals, it is difficult to write about Sparta and its surrounding territory. Laconia The problem is not lack of sources, the volume of ancient writing on Sparta is large. The difficulty lies in the fact that many of our sources are tainted by their acceptance of an idealized image of Sparta that historians call the Spartan Mirage. This idea of Sparta was a vision of an egalitarian and orderly society characterized by patriotism, courage in battle, and tolerance for deprivation. The Dark Age and the Archaic Period Laconia was an important center in the Bronze Age. Like much of the rest of Greece, Laconia experienced a sharp drop in population at the end of the Mycenaean period. Sometime in the 10th century BC Dorian newcomers entered the territory. By the 8th century BC trends similar to those documented elsewhere in Greece had begun to appear in Laconia as well. New villages were founded as population gradually increased. And four of those villages near the Euorotus River in the center of the Laconian plain united to form the city of Sparta. Early in the 8th century the town of Amicle three miles from the original four villages, was added to the city. Thus the Spartan polis was the city center plus the territory of the plain. Increased contacts with the rest of Greece were reflected in the emergence of a distinctive Spartan version of geometric art. Like other early Greek polis, Sparta or Lacedaemon, as it was often called in antiquity, began to experience difficulties in satisfying its needs from its own territory. Sparta was located inland, with the nearest port, Gythium, 27 miles to the south. This atypical location encouraged the city to seek a novel solution to the need for land to feed a growing population. A solution that would determine the course of Spartan development. Unlike other Greek cities, which repeatedly founded colonies overseas in an effort to alleviate the pressure on resources caused by population expansion. The Spartans founded only one colony, Terras in southern Italy. Instead of looking abroad for a solution to their difficulties, the Spartans sought a military answer to their problem through conquest of their neighbors. And by the end of the 8th century, they had gained control of the plain of Laconia, Helots and the social hierarchy. To ensure control of the Laconian plain, its inhabitants were reduced to the status of Helots, hereditary subjects of the Spartan state. The rest of the inhabitants of Laconia, who occupied the area surrounding the city of Sparta, became perioikoi, those who dwell around Sparta or neighbors. Unlike the helots, who were in essence slaves, the perioikoi remained free. Although they were obligated to serve in the army, they were not permitted to participate in the government. They did enjoy some local autonomy. However, and in many ways lived like the majority of Greeks who were not Spartans, working as homemakers, farmers, craftsmen, and merchants. Thus they constituted an essential part of the Spartan economic system. The Spartans also coveted the fertile Mycenaean lowlands. And at some time in the third quarter of the 8th century they invaded Mycenae, beginning what modern historians call the First Mycenaean War. According to tradition the war lasted 20 years and ended about 720 BC. Mycenae became subject to Sparta. And like the Laconians, some of the Mycenaeans became perioikoi. But most became helots. 
bound to their land and obliged to work it for their Spartan masters with no consolation but the promise that they would not be sold out of Messenia. The conquest of Laconia and Messenia made Sparta one of the largest of Greek states. Controlling a territory of over 3,000 square miles, about three times the size of the Athenian state. Sparta was also one of the richest states. Spartan pottery and metalwork were among the finest in Greece. The beauty of Spartan women was widely celebrated. And Sparta's female choruses were famous. A vivid impression of the wealth and elegance of Spartan life is provided by a few surviving fragments of the works of the 7th century BC poet Alcman, whose hymns, written for choruses of unmarried Spartan girls to sing on ceremonial occasions. Mention Luxury items including racehorses, purple textiles, and gold jewelry in the shape of serpents. Spartan prosperity, however, rested on insecure foundations. Civil unrest in the late 8th and early 7th centuries was avoided by exiling dissidents who founded Sparta's only colony, Teres. The growing desperation of the Messenians was a more serious threat. Greek political theorists considered it a mistake to enslave people in their own home territory, especially when the enslaved significantly outnumbered their masters, as the Messenians did the Spartans. In the end Sparta prevailed and the Messenians had no choice but to resign themselves to the rigors of their former helot status. The Second Messenian War had been a terrifying revelation of the potential risks of the helot system. As a result of the conquest of neighboring regions the Sparta helots outnumbered Spartan citizens by a ratio that may have been seven to one or even higher. The Spartans were forced to find a way to preserve their domination over their helots. The solution they found was drastic. And its implementation gradually transformed Sparta and eventually created the unique regimented society known to us from the classical sources. Simply stated, the Spartans realized that if all potential hoplites could be trained to the highest degree of skill possible, Sparta would enjoy an overwhelming military advantage over its helots and other enemies. Therefore the Spartans reformed their institutions with a view toward achieving two goals. Freeing male citizens from all but military obligations. And socializing them to accept the regimentation and discipline required of a Spartan soldier. Until the 4th century and the Hellenistic period. The Spartans were the only real professional soldiers. In effect they waged a perpetual war against the helots and were consequently always prepared to deploy their military force when necessary. The Spartan System Little is known about the actual development of the Spartan system. Greek historians followed Spartan tradition and ascribed its creation to Lycurgus, a shadowy figure who may or may not really have lived. Scholars today are agreed that many of the institutions whose creation Greeks ascribed to Lycurgus, such as men's dining groups, organization of the population by age cohorts, and the use of iron money, had, in fact, once existed in other Greek communities. These practices survived at Sparta because their place in Spartan life had been redefined to aid in the production of the ideal Spartan hoplite. However this evolution occurred. The evidence indicates that the main features of the Spartan system were in place by the end of the 7th or the early 6th century BC. The Spartan regime may be called totalitarian for it touched on almost every aspect of life, including those we in modern Western society consider private. How to wear our hair. The choice of whether and when to marry. The conditions of conjugal intercourse. And the decision whether to rear a child. The education and upbringing of boys. As the poetry of Tertius made plain. The Spartan ideal for a man was to be skilled and courageous in battle.
neither to run away nor surrender but to stand his ground and give up his life for his city. Training was designed to produce men who conformed to this pattern alone. The Spartan was liable for military service to the age of 60 and needed to stay fit, hence he never was trained for any other profession or way of life. The Educational System Like much else that was unique to Sparta, received legitimacy from the insistence that it was created by Lycurgus. The process of creating invincible warriors began at birth. For the state took upon itself the right to determine a new baby's viability. Whereas other Greek polis left the choice to the father. At Sparta officials appointed by the government examined the newborns. The vitality of male infants and their potential as soldiers determined whether they would be raised or abandoned. Female babies, apparently, were not subjected to official scrutiny, for their physical prowess did not directly affect the outcome of battles. Fathers did not decide how to raise their children. Rather, all children received the same education under state supervision. Education in Sparta, as elsewhere, was organized by age groups. Children, boys, youths, ephebes, young men, and adults. From the age of seven, boys left home to be trained in groups called herds according to principles designed to encourage conformity. Obedience, group solidarity, and military skills. The emphasis in the boys' education was not on reading and writing, but rather on practicing to endure hardships and to fend for themselves as would be necessary when they became hoplite soldiers. To toughen their feet, they went barefoot, and they often went naked as well. When they were twelve, their hair was cut short. They never wore a tunic and were each allocated only one cloak yearly to wear in all kinds of weather. Unlike the rest of the Greeks, who made war only in the summer, the Spartans were perpetually at war with the helots and therefore needed to be prepared to fight year-round. Magistrates called ephors, overseers, inspected the boys daily and examined them in the nude every ten days. The boys slept in groups on rough mats that they had made themselves to develop cunning and self-reliance. They were encouraged to supplement their food rations by stealing. Whipping awaited anyone who revealed his lack of skill by getting caught. From the ages of 14 to 20 the Ephebes performed their preliminary military service. At 20 they grew their hair long, unlike men in other parts of the Greek world, and shaved themselves in the distinctive Spartan style, a long beard and no mustache. Between ages 20 and 30 they were permitted to marry but had to continue to live with their army groups until the age of 30. Acceptance into a secession, dining group. Mess, was an essential stage in reaching adulthood. The Spartan man ate his meals with about 15 members of his army group. An experience that fostered the loyalty and cooperativeness essential to successful hoplite warfare. Each member of the secession was obliged to contribute a fixed quantity of food and drink. The secessia were in some ways analogous to the symposia, drinking parties, enjoyed by Greeks elsewhere. But the fact that the Spartan was purposely schooled to drink in moderation points to an important difference. Greeks usually mixed their wine with water. Helots, however, were forced to consume undiluted wine and to perform vulgar and ridiculous songs and dances to exemplify the consequences of lack of control. Young Spartans, who were invited to the Sisitia as part of their education, were encouraged to laugh at the spectacle of the drunken helots. The lesson was a double one. From this experience youths were expected to learn both to be wary of drinking to excess for inebriation could lead to death in conditions of perpetual warfare, and to view the helots as pathetic creatures, patently inferior to the Spartan soldiery. Inevitably, 
The success rate in forging soldiers according to the prescribed mold was less than 100%. Though the harsh treatment of those perceived Sparta as cowards discouraged failure. Some boys failed to develop as expected. Since martial valor offered the sole path to the honor and respect of one's peers, life was wretched for boys who were unable to cope with the rigors of military life. When cowards were identified, they were stigmatized and called tremblers. Their ridiculous appearance announced their disgrace. They were obliged to wear cloaks with colored patches and to only partially shave their beards. Humiliated in public, they were despised even by their own kinsmen, whom they were believed to have dishonored. They could not hold public office, nor was it likely that anyone would marry them or their sisters, with the consequence that their family would die out and the eugenic goals of the state be well served. Becoming a Spartan Woman Sparta's military ethos had implications for females as well as males. Just as boys were brought up to become brave fighters, girls were raised to bear stalwart soldiers to be. Spartans were the only Greek women whose upbringing was prescribed by the state and who were educated at state expense. For example, unlike other Greek women, who spent most of their time indoors and were regularly given less food than men and no wine, Spartan females exercised outside, were well nourished, and drank wine as part of their daily diet. Childbearing was their only social obligation. Though, like all Greek women, they did know how to weave. They were free from the obligation to engage in any other form of domestic labor. Specific lines of development were prescribed for Spartan girls much as they were for boys. The educational system for girls was also organized according to age classes. Girls were divided into the categories of children. Young girls, maidens who had reached puberty, and married women. Hairstyles announced a woman's passage through the life cycle. As a maiden, she wore her hair long and loose, as a bride. Her hair was cropped, as a married woman. Her hair was covered. As with so much else in their way of life, Spartans ascribed the customary upbringing of Spartan girls to Lycurgus, as is the case in many warlike societies. The perpetual absence of men on military duty created a division of labor in which women managed domestic affairs.